So, and it's <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's a good time. Okay. All right. So we left off on uh, slide 24. Lots of information on these slides, so they take a while to cover. We talked about intentionalism. We talked about voluntarism and nominalism. Uh, that's on slide 24. Slide 25, you have modern antinomianism. What is nomianism? It comes from the Greek word namas, which means, uh, not nomas, <laughs> namas, which means law. So antinomianism is against law, right? Without rule, without an absolute ethic, and without moral objectivism flowing from God. They're sort of hardcore atheism, really. Now, Utilitarianism, the infamous utilitarian calculus, right, from John Stuart Mill, the greatest good for the greatest number of people, right? You also have that in Jeremy Bentham, actually him first, I would say. In all, this modernized view is drawing upon ancient hedonism. Uh, in Bentham, we discover the greatest good in a quantitative sense for the greatest number of people. In John Stuart Mill, also a huge proponent of utilitarianism, he argues in a qualitative sense. He argued that some pleasures are greater or of, quote, more quality, unquote, than others. In other words, it is better to be an unhappy man, an unhappy man, than a happy pig. Uh, wow. For both Bentham and Mill, there are no absolute moral laws. Why? Because if there's, if there's no moral law giver, there can be no absolute law. Now, if you take that view, right, you still have to appreciate people trying to create an ethical system that does make sense. I mean, you try to do it. <laughs> just say atheism is true. Now come up with an ethic. I would just say, you know what? It's all relative. It doesn't matter. And that's sort of what the existentialists said, right, of France. Like, you know, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, right? There's no difference between being an alcoholic or the king of a country. No difference at all. Nothing in the end matters. God does not exist. Be a king or a homeless guy, it doesn't matter. One's not greater than the other. Crazy when you think about it. There you are. I thought the rapture happened. We've been missing you. That would be unfortunate if you were still here. I know. Well, you know, we just uh, came Palladians. We just church history. Corey's struggling with Arianism right now. You're growing a long beard. Are you trying to uh, go Greek Orthodox now? Yeah, Russian maybe? Mr. Nastrov, Yezhivyu. Talking like those guys. All right, now, uh, existentialism, right, out of France. But we also have a Danish thinker by the name of Søren Kierkegaard. He was a Christian. And he sort of became an existentialist, but with Christian theology hand in hand. And really, what I think it is, is more like fideism. Fideism, a blind leap of faith, right? To step into the dark because it goes back to Genesis um, uh, where Abraham is asked to kill his son Isaac. And Sarah's going, what's the reason for that? That's just blind faith on steroids. So you know what? Uh, We've got to take it with, uh, uh, with, with a blind, big leap of faith. He was really troubled. Um, but in any event, uh, I think existentialism per certain regard got us somewhat in trouble. Now, this is my neighboring country where I grew up, and he's in the 18th century, 1833, 1855, the father of Danish existentialism. You have really three main proponents of existentialism. Jean-Paul Sartre was Fran French, right? So is Albert Camus, okay? And then now you have Søren Kierkegaard. Uh, let's see here. Kierkegaard was a Christian, while Sartre and Camus were atheists. And uh, here it seems to me, all right, some would disagree, that Kierkegaard got us in trouble um, in his skeptical approach to ethics, Genesis 22. How could there be any moral justification for Abraham being told to offer Isaac? How? Other than prophecy? Yet, if prophetic, and in turn Jesus died for the sins of the world, which is also a moral matter, <laughs> a divine moral matter, then it is moral and not beyond. He argued that the highest duty of man goes beyond moral law. So, a little brief summary of Kierkegaard. Um, let me blow up the screen. Actually, I'm not. You guys, we just have to go together here. Um, in Sartre, we see Kierkegaard's skepti skeptical ethics, um, uh, while some call it antinomianism. 
Well, really, Sir Kierkegaard, you can't call him an antinomian because he believed that there was a moral law flowing from the, from the nature of God. And by the way, ethics doesn't flow from God's moral will. It flows from his nature. He didn't will the Ten Commandments because then he could rewrite them and call them whatever they want. Now you have relativism with God. It's stuck in his eternal nature. Sartre claimed that ethics has no real meaning. You know, back in those days, Sartre would like... Uh, uh, write a play, and you would show up at a theater and sit there. Hundreds of people. Jean-Paul Sartre's new thing, right? He wrote, he wrote one book called No Exit. You know what that means? There's no exit. You can't, you can't beat death. Death is coming for you, and it's terrible. You shall be no more. There's no eternal life. You are just a freak of nature, and Mother Nature is going to swallow you whole, and you are food for worms. Now, what should we do? Kill ourselves right now? <laughs> Why not? No, let's not do that. Let's smoke our cigars at the coffee houses in France and tighten our bootstraps, right? And just march on towards death. At least he was consistent. Quite a guy. Huh? Quite a guy. Quite a, Quite a fella. So, but you know, if you are an existentialist and you're an atheist, life has no real meaning. If this is just an accident, yeah. we are like cosmic orphans floating on a planet in a hostile, horrifying universe. No rhyme or reason, guided by natural law that just, you know, came onto the scene by themselves. We are misfits of evolution. We are freaks of nature. Forget this image of God business. We're accidents. We have no father, no mother. We're cosmic orphans just floating around. So, having said it, put it that way, if there is no God and there's no meaning for life and there is no destiny and so on, there's no compass, there's no map of where to go. Um, I recommended this before. I know you got the book. Get Tom, Tom Morris's book, um, Making Sense of It All. Tom Morris, Catholic philosopher, he wrote a book called uh, Making Sense of It All. And really what it is, is... Uh, Blaise Pascal's Pensees. Blaise Pascal was a French thinker, right? Uh, he wrote a book, or he didn't write a book. His collected writings that they found sewn inside of his coat, sewed shut. He had his little papers in here. They put it together, and they were just reflective thoughts. Pensees in Fran Fr French means thoughts. So they put those together, and you can read it. But Tom Morris has a way with words. Very good book, Making Sense of It All. I would, in other classes that I've taught, um, where well, I could like pick four books because I was teaching for four months, not short modules like this. I was the teacher that was hated. But I would always say, Tom Morris is a requirement. I want a book report on that. Didn't matter if it was ethics, I thought, theology, everybody has to read it. Not everybody that actually read it come up and go, that's one of the best books I've ever read. It's so good, you might as well buy two because I get the royalties. I'm kidding. No, because you're going to want to hand one to somebody else that you really care about. It's really good stuff. All right, evolutionism. Huh? Making Sense of It All by Thomas V. Morris. All right, uh, evolutionism, right? Here we got Darwinism. Evolutionism and ethics. What's that go? Uh, T.H. Huxley and Julian Huxley sought to establish an evolutionary ethic. That's kind of that's hard, right? A moral law that's changing. So how do they do that? Their grounding of this ethic is Darwinism. Here it is claimed that whatever aims and benefits the evolutionary process uh, undergoes is what is right. Um, and whatever hinders it, it's wrong. But hold on a second. How does that become an issue of morality? Survival of the fittest? Okay, so tomorrow we all grow three arms and four legs. Let's just say that happens. Well, that's good now because now we have six eyeballs. But if we lose an eye, all of a sudden now that's, an, that's, that's evil, you know? That, that would be wrong. That, that's not furthering the human cause. Are you with me? But hold on a second. If I lost an eyeball tomorrow, all of humanity did. Who are you to say that I ought to have two? Do you see that, the presupposition here, that there's an ought here? I ought to have two eyeballs, not one. Oughtness, you can't have it without God. Just that like you can't have morality without there being a certain way that things ought to be. There's an oughtness to the world. Abortions ought not to be happening. You ought not to cut out a fetus. You ought not to uh, be dating males if you're a male. You ought not to get married with the same sex. It just goes against physiology, goes against nature, 
and it goes against Darwinism. <laughs> it goes against God if he exists. If evolution and atheism is true, it goes against the survival of the fittest. It's not the survival of the fittest. It's not a fittest procedure. Yeah, and the definition that I like to use in regards to these matter is, is again, natural. What's natural is not how you feel. It's how one's physiological parts physically operate together. Read between the lines. So that would be what you could say with an atheist. Natural is not how one feels, but how one's physiological parts operate physiologically. If you're talking to Christians that are confused on the issue, you can say natural is not how, how one feels, but rather how design parts operate designably. So either way, uh, I think the voice of reason there is hard to just admit it and go, you know what? It is messed up. Yeah, I probably shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. I appreciate that better, you know, than trying to say uh, Paul was a you know, chauvinist, a first century fool in the book of Romans where he condemns it. Right. Yes. In the, in the part of the homosexuality, mm -hmm. how can it be so blind and, and not knowing that the body? Because Roman, Romans one answers that. It's, 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 they go against the, the yeah. Of the, the good. Romans one, you know, where that word they continually right suppress the truth. That word suppress in the original language is a continual rejection a continual pushing down you know I remember Christ he says I love you know you love darkness rather than light so they exchange the truth for a lie right according to Paul in Romans right they suppressed the truth in their unrighteousness and then there's that scary part of Romans 1 and 2 that says but God gave them up and when, when, when God gives you over to your depraved mind you're just going down that moral spiral. You won't even know what's left or right. It's similar to, let's say one of you guys or, or girls in here are to starting to toy with a sin. Starting to mess with a sin a little too much. <laughs> Shouldn't mess with it all, right? But that sin becomes easier and easier and easier. And the voice of reason and the voice of conscience and the voice of the Holy Spirit gets quieter and quieter quieter and quieter and quieter because you're quenching the Holy Spirit. It's almost like a flame and you put your hand on it and you're just quenching the flame. He can't be with you if you're at a strip club. He can't. He's not going to sit there and watch that. If you're doing cocaine at work, he's not going to sit there and watch you do that. Same thing with adultery. Same thing with all sins. So, uh, nothing to play with. Yes? Uh, I come from, from different countries. Uh, I was surprised that the Supreme Court passed a law in Utah and Oklahoma. Yeah. They were in a state with a very conservative about homosexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, it broke my heart really seeing this happen in America. Yeah, 30 states now, something, right? Frightening. Frightening. But um, you know what? The world hates the light, they love evil, and they're going to call evil good and call good evil. And that's exactly what we watch. You go out there and say something against homosexuality, all of a sudden now you're a bigot or you're evil. If you say something about abortion because you, you're interested in preserving the human life, which, by the way, would also be survival of the fittest, right? You ought not to rip it out. Let it have its natural course. I always use the analogy of aborting a, aborting a fetus, like they call it, after Roe v. Wade. They impersonalized it. It was always called in the medicinal books um, small-scale baby prior to Roe v. Wade in 73. 1973, Roe v. Wade, the abortion controversy at the Supreme Court. And uh, after Roe v. Wade, an abortion was becoming legal, the medical textbooks for doctors, they changed the word small-scale baby to fetus because it sounds like a chair or the hood of a car. Remember, you're supposed to distance yourself from the patient, right? So my son's like, I want to be a doctor, but I can't look at all the blood. You're going to be taught that that's just motor oil to distance yourself from the patient. You're just a mechanic working on a biological machine, so to speak. Yes? Well, you know, that Roe v. Wade, they based it on a woman's right to privacy. So they kind of, in a way, left the baby out of entirely. That, that, that was going to be my next point. So yeah. when you are pro-life, all of a sudden now you're against women. No, I'm not. Not. <laughs> I think uh, it's not a women's rights right issue. There are two. There, 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 there's another person's rights too. Yeah. 
What about he or she? It never referred to the fetus. And fetus in Latin, by the way, it means the same thing. Small scale baby. Little one. <laughs> baby. Just give it a Latin term. It's all good. To... Because if you say, I have the right to terminate my small scale baby, doesn't sound really good, does it? No, you sound like the mom, mom on Facebook who had a uh, uh, mentally challenged son, and she says, uh, I had I known this, I would have killed him myself. Wow. I would have boarded him or killed him myself. So, beautiful daughter, and then a kid that doesn't look all there, and it's just sad. All right, so. Um, the three main evolutionary principles are, number one, it is morally right to recognize new and futuristic evolutionary possibilities. Well, that's not open. That's totally open in the left field. Two, human individuality is to be respected. Oh, there's an ought there. Hear that? Where is that? Is to be. That's an ought. Now they're doing ethics. Is to be respected, says who? Why not kill the Jews? Why not kill the Christians in, 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 in Syria? What ISIS is doing? Why not? Who are you to say that they shouldn't? So human individuality is to be respected, including its fullest development. And three, it is right to construct a mechanism for furthering social evolution. This is sociology, biology. It's not philosophical ethics. It's not ethics. Evolutionary process is going to make man better. Yep. They're, they're doing away with individuals. This, this doesn't make any sense. And what does the ancient, ancient philosophers say? Man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. Well, if man is the measure of all things, we might as well just call it a day. Because what measuring stick is he using? And what's funny here is, in perspective now, we've talked quite a bit about C.S. Lewis. The last two, three years we've been doing this here. Not CCU, but we've been teaching this type of stuff here for a number of years now. Is when C.S. Lewis says, You will not recognize what is crooked unless you have an idea of what's straight. Okay? Keep that in mind as you're reading about all these different views of ethics. Because right here, what it says it's morally right to recognize new and futuristic possibilities. Morally right? Okay? Number two, human individuality is to be. That's in other words to say you ought to respect human beings and individuality. These are sort of like command claims, but they're not really grounded. So there's an ought without it being grounded. But when you're looking at the Darwinists or the, or the seculars trying to create a moral view, an ethical system apart from theism, what happens? They're employing that. You can't recognize what's cricket unless you have an idea of straight. Just like you can't recognize what, uh, the imperfect without an idea of perfection. Show me one thing in this world that's perfect. You don't have an idea of what's per what perfect is, but, but based on what you've seen and observed in this physical universe, show me perfection anywhere. Show me. Is there a perfect tree? Perfect car? I thought my diesel excursion was perfect. It's in the shop. It's leaking all sorts of stuff. <laughs> so many problems with that thing. It's in the shop every four months, and it's like, I don't care. <laughs> you know? But um, it, it has an ought, and that's just to <clears throat> floor it. Um, very strong for a big vehicle. But anyway, um, the ought here is, is implied in what they're trying to do. Uh, they recognize that there's an idea of straightness, that we have to solve this crookedness, because there is moral evil, even though we're not going to call it really, really evil, because what's evil? A rotten strawberry in Denmark? What is it? Um, so, now, we can't see anything perfect. Same thing as C.S. Lewis talks about. You won't recognize what, what's imperfect, and that covers a lot of ground, right? Sin, whatever. Homosexuality is crooked, because <laughs> it's not straight. <laughs> Apply that to the straight life, it really works good. If it ain't straight, it's cricket, right? And you know what? The credit card answers against homosexuality is what? Plumbing doesn't fit. Nobody got here by homosexual union. And if you stop, you'll probably live longer. Those are the radio answers. If you're ever on, this, on, on a program and somebody calls in, you move on to the next caller. 
move fast. Um, so you can't show me anything perfect, right, in the world. You have an idea of what perfect is, though. We say God is perfect. Well, when did you see him? Right? You have an idea of what's perfect. Where does that idea of perfection really come from? It comes from the perfect being. But you can't see it in your own world. Yet you know what's imperfect based on the idea of perfection. This is very powerful stuff. But um, it's called a purpose which is the nature of the way we can make nature. Uh, mankind destroying nature, that's why we have consequence about mm. the weather, tornadoes, and, you know, typhoons, and so on and so forth. But that, 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 if you uh, think about the world, it's perfect. It's perfect to the, uh, the distance to the sun, for example. Mm. If the, if, the, if the earth moves just a little bit, we sure. will get burned. Yeah. No. But it's still the same place. It's, yeah. not, a, it's not global warming that's alive. It's yep. just man is sending the planet. Sure. Building more roads, building sure. more freeways, building more whatever, and taking the breath out of the earth, contaminating the ocean with the chicks, going to the sure. of Mexico with the Exxon, you know. and so and so. We destroy the world ourselves, I yeah. think. Because the world is perfect. Yeah. Look at the ocean. I'm going this morning to the sea beach. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's perfect ocean. Oh, my God. But no, you have to. Why is the one over my head? I mean, I'm, you know, right? Yeah. Yeah, but you have to remember, too, you can't say that the world is perfect because the entire universe is fallen. Yeah, the world was perfect. The world was, was perfect in the Garden of Sweden, Garden of Swekas, Garden of, Garden of Eden, Garden of Sweden. Yeah, it's a joke. Hold on. Hold on. What I'm saying, though, is when Adam and Eve blew it, right, not only was death introduced into their life, the universe, the entire universe was cursed, which is why we read that the universe groans for redemption. Yet it's mindless. The universe doesn't think. Stars, just gases and debris on fire. Right. And the sun is our main sequence star in our galaxy. So what you're referring to here as far as the, 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 the planetary system and, and the moon causing gravity and the moon and the sun over here and the perfect, call that the anthropic principle. Astronomers just coming down with all these things going, wow, this thing sure appears to be designed. But my point is, though, the world is completely fallen. It needs to be redeemed. You know, we're running out of usable energy thermodynamics, the sun is shrinking five feet per hour, right? You and everything around you, including every flower, right, is progressing toward winter, or call it death. Right. Soon as you're born, look at that baby. This is where philosophy kind of stinks. You look at the little baby and you go, I'm a parent now. It's progressing towards death. Soon as it's born. Right now, you're headed toward death. Every step of the way. Kind of a morbid way to look at it. But man, if we didn't have the hope of Christ... See how meaningless it really would be when you think about these things. All right, we've got to move on. So, you were talking about Hitler, you know, and the Aryan race, and how they contradict themselves. Well, here we go. In Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, what does that mean? My fight. Kampf. My uh, Mein Kampf. We ought, um, or we see one attempt to work out an evolutionary ethic by applying natural selection. Darwinism's origin of species, right, got Hitler in trouble. Not natural selection, he's murdering people. I just want to say that. Yeah. But let me ask you this. <laughs> he's not dying by natural means. That's all I'm saying. But uh, what's, what's natural selection? Does nature think? Does nature select what book to read? It's a contradiction in the term natural selection. Yeah. Nature doesn't select, it doesn't think, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything, really, unless there's a telos behind it, a purpose a goal-oriented, an acorn becoming a full-fledged oak tree. And we talked about these things, right? Uh, the, 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 ba the baby acorn, the little acorn that becomes a full-fledged oak tree, right, according to Aristotle and the other philosophers, is what? It has a basic inherent capacity of becoming a full-fledged oak tree, but the little acorn doesn't think, like, I can't wait to be like Papa Tree or Mama Tree. He doesn't think. Yet, it's being programmed with information. It's telos, like this in Greek, telos which means goal or purpose. It's goal or purpose. Pre-programmed, all it needs is natural light, right? Some dirt and time. And it's progressing towards its natural end, telos, purpose, or goal to become a full-fledged oak tree. Same thing Stephen Schwartz argues in his book on abortion. He says that the, the small-scale baby has the basic inherent capacity of a full-fledged human being. It's progressing naturally, teleologically, towards his goal of becoming a full-fledged oak tree. 
this, the egg and the sperm, once it unites, right, has everything that you have. It's just not fully fledged or developed yet. It's still humanness that's there. It's a human entity. It's not fish DNA, if you want to say it's a fish. It's not crocodile DNA. So when the sperm and the egg unite, what are we doing ethics right now? It's, it's all right. Um, I don't have to touch on too much of this when we get to abortion at the end of the module. But um, so if you have a premature baby, a preemie that's born, right? Say two months early. Put, in, put the baby, almost said it, can't say it. Put the baby in an incubator. Can you walk up and stab it in the incubator? No, it's murder. But you could stab it if it's in the womb of a mother. But it's sort of like, soon as it comes out, what? How many inches away from the air we breathe is the baby? What? Seven? I don't know the distance for exit to where the baby is. <laughs> but let's just call it a foot. <laughs> let's gonna call it a foot. All right. You don't become human by being outside of the womb any more, any more than this. Check this out. I'm a human being right now, but now I'm not. <laughs> now I'm a human. Now I have rights, but I don't have rights in here. No. You know what? Rights or, or, or humanness or your right as a human being, you don't change by moving a location. Just like moral evil, if done in privacy, by switching a location, doesn't make it right. So, you know, when George Michael was caught at the public park, right, doing his little thing, it didn't, that despicable act does not become right by doing it in a condo in West Hollywood. An act does not become more moral or right by doing it in privacy. You can't kill in private. Homosexuality does not become right in private. Nor does your humanness change by moving from one location to another. Walking into a room, coming out of the womb. Same thing. Okay, we've got to move on. So, Hitler argued here that the Aryan race is obviously superior uh, as such, and is the fittest of all humanity. Thus, the Aryans, um, the Aryan and strongest race, ought to be preserved. In turn, the weaker and inferior breeds, um, you know, just kill them off, so to speak. Why not? Again, to have an inferior human being is like having Down syndrome couples giving birth to babies, right? Helpless little things. And, and the Jews are just the lowest of the lowest of the totem pole of humanity. You know, the Aryans are here at the top. You know, you know how they could tell what an Aryan is? I hate to say this, what you're looking at right now is 100% Aryan, according to what he's saying. We have a little bump in the back of our head right here. Right here? Yeah. Big bump. If you didn't have that bump, your history. Yeah. I'm okay. You're okay? <laughs> no, weird things that I would just dream of. <laughs> All right, so... Um, the ones that are less than fittest ought to be weeded out. Weed them out. The end result of such an ethic in practice, uh, you know, we have six million Jews and millions of others who were killed and buried. Now, uh, Origin of Species, Mein Kampf, this information that you see in Darwin uh, was also shared with Stalin. And Stalin makes Hitler look like a kindergarten teacher because he didn't just kill other people. He killed his own. And then you can look at China. How many... Uh, people have, you know, just been murdered in the name of atheistic communism. You know what? Take the atheistic deaths, right? <laughs> Murders caused by atheistic regimes, they outnumber every religious war combined throughout world history. So it's not true that people have been, you know, more people have been killed in the name of religion. No, it's exactly the opposite. And the difference is, for, for example, we talk Islam, right? Die by the sword of Allah. Right? What does Jesus say? Live by the sword, die by the sword. So if you have Christians running around shooting people, or crusaders killing people, and raping Jews, and raping Arabs, and raping other kill, killing Christians in Jerusalem as they're going, right, to reclaim it for Rome, etc., etc., well, they might have a cross. They might have a shield, right, and parade through whatever. They were like welders of the day, farmers. Go and kill. Here's your key to go to heaven, right? You know, 
get whatever you want. Take take some of this stuff, and uh, you know you're going to be wealthy. Just go. And then Pope saying you will for sure be granted eternal life. Well, what the Crusaders did, if that's being brought up, and it depends on who you read. Some say the Crusaders didn't do the things that your textbook says. You know, some people defend the Crusaders. Interesting reads, but I'm picking that because it's a Protestant institution. Um, but in any event, um, move on. Ideas have consequences. And to say the least, all ideas are not equal. And it's okay for you to say that. When someone says, well, you know, that's just my opinion. Okay, well, your opinion really is terrible. And, uh, well, why are, you, why are you so intolerant? Because all ideas are not equal. And, and I'm going to be truthful with you right now. I don't have to tolerate stupid ideas. I know it sounds mean, but I don't have to. If you tell me the moon is made out of cheese, like original Mormonism, Joseph Smith, the moon is made out of cheese. Really? Take that straight out of Scripture. I don't belong. I don't have to tolerate that. Now, he said that before we went to the moon. But what does that mean? Did you mean it looks like a cheese, or there's actually milk products on the moon, or are the nachos? What's up there? So if you're telling me that uh, you are divine, or something like that, or you believe in reincarnation, I'm going to say, what were you in your last life? I have no idea. <laughs> you should know something if you believe in reincarnation. You don't know nothing. I don't have to tolerate dumb ideas, and some ideas are really, really dumb. You know what I say, there's no stupid question? Yes, there are. Many stupid questions, but we have to. <laughs> but we have to do what we can to address it. Listen, why am I why am I sharing this and making a little bit of a, of a point on this? It's not to make you calloused. It's not to make you make you evil. It's for you to stand up and just go. Listen, all ideas are not equal. They're not. Period. And I don't have to tolerate that. And if you want to get in, you know, get in bed with the tolerance movement, the politically correct. Know this. I'm going to ask you a question. On the topic of ethics, all the controversial things that are right now politically loaded, right? We are sort of in the same boat, right? We're all Christian theists, are we? Okay. Um, do you tolerate me, Lindsay? All the time. No. <laughs> Let's be serious. Well, we if you and I agree on the pro-life view, do you tolerate me? Do I tolerate you? Exactly. So what is, to what is tolerance? Then? Tolerance, get this, tolerance presupposes disagreement. This is one of those Starbucks things like, what? Say that again. No, what I'm trying to get to now is the person who calls me intolerant, I'm going to say, you want me to be tolerant, right? Yes, I do. All right. Of what? Let's just say the gay lifestyle. And then th that other person, chances are 9 out of 10, they're liberal. And they're going to go, because I'm tolerant, and you ought to be tolerant like me. But wait a second, I am tolerant, because I disagree with them. So you, too, <laughs> disagree with them. Tolerance presupposes disagreement, because you don't tolerate that which you agree with. Do you guys get that? It's a, it's a word that they hide behind. Right. That's what the Bill Mars need to hear. Bill Maher, right? Um, and what else? Um, Tolerance, right? It, it's sort of self-refuting because the moment uh, I'm, I'm just going to say, let's role play, Corey. I'm going to say um, um, I want you to uh, just say it's just wrong for you to be intolerant, right? It's just wrong for you to be intolerant. I'm going to go. Why? Now we're going to get the ought. Because you're not tolerating my tolerating my intolerance. Right. You should be tolerating my intolerance. It's just wrong to be intolerant. Why? Because it's wrong. What ought I do? I, you ought to be tolerant. Oh, so, so we got a virtue here. Well, first of all, the people who hide behind that, tolerance presupposes disagreement, right? In the first place, just to prove my point, you ought to be tolerant of my intolerance. So maybe I'm a little less tolerant than you are, but really, we're one and the same. You're not tolerating me, I'm not tolerating you. But really, we are, because I disagree with you, therefore I'm tolerant. I'm not shooting you, right? So, all right. Next, uh, emotivism. Sounds fancy, huh? A.J. Ayer, hardcore guy. Hardcore guy. Uh, he asserts that moral statements are merely emotive. Thus, ethical statements and claims are no more than feelings expressed. In short, if I say thou shalt not kill for Ayer or Ayer, uh, this means I don't like killing. 
What is he doing here? He's reducing moral truth claims down to the feeling realm, right? Well, it's almost like preference claims. Yeah. Uh, I don't like killing, but I like chocolate ice cream. <laughs> There's a difference between truth claims and preference, preference claims. I feel that killing is wrong. And by the way, never use the word feel when you're sharing the gospel or talking about a sincere subject or if you're teaching. Well, I feel that. I don't care how you feel. I want to hear you say, I think, I think that, not I feel. You know how the modern, modern teenagers talk. Well, I feel like she's all like, she goes, and he's all like that and stuff like that. And, you know, and then I fell out, and he, and he goes, and she's like, <laughs> like, what did you just say? All right, so yet, in the absolute sense, um, there is nothing right or wrong about it, <laughs> really. Ethics, therefore, is reduced to the subjective realm. Subjectivism, making it purely relativistic. It's not grounded in emotions. Uh, nihilism, you've heard of nihilism, right? You're such a nihilist, you might have heard of that. Friedrich Nietzsche of Germany. He was the, uh, the spoiled philosopher, very ticked off philosopher, raised by, I believe, his mother and a sister or two. He was a spoiled little brat, upset at God and everybody else, you know? And you just tell his pictures, you know, his long mustache, and he just looks angry. And you're not many atheists, you know, they never had a fatherly figure. <laughs> He was definitely one of them. So Friedrich Nietzsche of Germany, uh, he says, God is dead. That's the God is dead. The movie God is not dead is to reverse this trend. God is dead because we have killed him. Now, that sounds terrible. Nietzsche is actually, philosophically, um, understanding that even if atheism is true, if you don't have the idea of God, all meaning and purpose is out the window. Sort of like the existentialist, right? Mm -hmm. So if you take God out of the equation, and, and man, you know, social creatures like we are, we kill the idea of God. Well, guess what? Um, moral chaos, right here, is inevitable. All objective morality perishes, perishes. it's gone, alongside once you kill the moral lawgiver. He understood the logical outwork. All right? Now, if you go to some of the Ivy League schools in the country, you know, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, is the greatest thing since Swiss cheese. So they think. He's dark. All right? He's very dark. Um, here's what, here's, here's, here's his, a little segment from his segment, uh, a paragraph from his madman. You can go on Google, type in Friedrich Nietzsche, the madman, and just hear how he's, he's, he's also sort of a poet. But here's what he says, quote, Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace, and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Look at this idiot, right? Has he got lost? asked one. Did he lose his way like a child? asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage? Emigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. And it says, quote, Whither is God? Where is God? he cried. I will tell you. We have killed him. You and I all of us are his murderers. But how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe out the entire horizon? What we were doing when we unchained, what were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Where are we moving away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually? backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there any up or down left? Are we not straying, listen to this, as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of divine decomposition? God's too decompose. 
God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. The first time I read this, I was like, this guy's crazy. The madman is Nietzsche himself. Very prolific, though. Dark, dark, dark poetry. But he's a German philosopher. And um, this quote here really nails it in the sense that take God away and you have wiped away the entire horizon with your atheistic sponge. There is no, no, no morality. There is no meaning. You know, we have to pretend that there's meaning. So life becomes almost like a stage where we create rules that are not rules. We create laws that are not real laws. They're like speed limits. We can change them up and down. But forget the principle behind the speed limit. Don't drive too fast because you can kill people and killing people's wrong, right? So in that sense, what we're doing is we're living in a complete world of illusion. There's about 4,500 4, philosophers in this country. What they dream up in their home offices will eventually trickle down to the Senate and then it's voted for. And the hoi polloi, the masses, the people that have gone through the educational systems, of course, they'll vote for these things in favor. That's why we have gay rights. That's why abortion is legal. That is why blah, blah, blah. What the philosophers dream up trickles down eventually and it becomes public policy. They dream up the weird stuff. And there's only about 4,500 in the country, professional philosophers. So this stuff really does change minds. It does. It has a huge impact. But um, he's right, don't you think? Take out God, what is left? Nothing. So even though he's an atheist, he's not, he doesn't believe that God exists in the sense that we have killed God literally. You know, he's being a little sarcastic, it seems. And God's too decomposed, right? But um, having said that, it really does give... Uh, a strong statement for what antinomianism is all about. All right, C Nietzsche continues here. How do you comfort yourself? How, do we, how shall we comfort ourselves, the murderer of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood, blood off of us? Uh, what water is there for us to clean ourselves? Get it, holy water? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed, and whoever is born after us for the sake of this deed, he will belong to a higher history than all history hitherto. Unquote. So, yeah. Uh, definitely nuts. Contemporary antinomianism. Here the madman fell silent, uh, looked again at his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. They're looking at him like this madman running around. We, you guys have killed God. It's crazy. At last he threw his lantern to the ground, and it broke into pieces and went out. I have come too early, he said to them. My time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. Uh, it has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars require time. Deeds, um, though done, still require time to be seen and heard. This deed is more distant from them than most distant stars. And yet, we have done it ourselves. It has been related further that on the same day, the madman forced his way into several churches and there struck his rakirem, uh, meaning eternal rest for God. Let out and called to account, he is said always to have replied nothing but, quote, what, after all, are all these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchres of God? Unquote. Guy's nuts. Source Friedrich Nietzsche, the gay science, believe it or not, um, edited by uh, Kaufman. All right, so Nietzsche's correct summary here in that if God does not exist, ethics is illusory, right? It's illusory. It's complete. Let's, let's create a world of pretending that things are real, and it's a bad play. Almost like Camus, I mentioned earlier, his theater. You show up, pay big money, and the curtains would open for a minute, and all you got is trash. And then it would close. No exit. There's your purpose. 
One time I was teaching at a Bible college, and I, I made fun of uh, his play. <laughs> and the curtains would open. It's like 400 toilets on fire. <laughs> That's life. It just sounded funny. <laughs> People actually wrote it down. It starts with, <laughs> no, no toilets on fire. All right. Uh, let's see here. Along with the death of God or non-existence of God, all moral values die as well. Thus, we are left to ourselves to create our own meaningless virtues. Meaningless. You know, it's like Sartre says, you know, life has no meaning. <laughs> Do you mean that? <laughs> You'd have to say, yeah. Okay. Self-refuting, right? Uh, this can only be done by going above good and evil. How do you go above good and evil without having a reference point? Well, somehow just go above it. <clears throat> we must will our own good. All right, Nietzsche and nihilism. Nietzsche argued that he would rather will nothingness than not will at all. The willing of nothingness is pure nihilism. Uh, I took that from Plato, standard.edu. Uh, nihilism defined. Moral nihilism is the idea that nothing is morally wrong. Because there is no morality. Moral nihilism here is, is, is not about what is uh, semantically or metaphysically possible. Remember, we're dealing with metaphysics, right? Uh, it is just substantive, ne uh, substantive, negative, existential claim that there uh, does not exist anything that is morally wrong. It is, however, usually supplemented with an explanation of why people hold moral beliefs that are false. Um, just as the story of uh, Descartes' uh, deceiving demon. Um, is supposed to explain why our perceptual beliefs are false. Do you know about the deceiving demon? Okay, I'm going to give you a skeptical argument right now. Uh, Lindsay, prove this to me. Okay, here's reality. You're not here in this room. There is a demon who has your brain in a vat. Your brain is in a vat of water. And you have electrodes hooked up into this brain. And these electronic wires are programmed into a laptop and there's a demon sitting there pre-programming your mind with false beliefs refute that if I were to say is it not logically possible was well, ridiculous Nick all right well I think there was a female philosopher who wrote a PhD on that subject kid you not I believe so refute the claim all of your beliefs are pre-programmed as false belief by a demon sitting laughing on a chair just programming your mind with garbage God exists Jesus rose from the dead you're here you're not here you have kids and you don't you're just a brain sitting in a vat there it is that idea would be false too because if the if you've been pre-programmed with all false beliefs that would be false too that's all it takes to refute it Okay, there's one true idea, <laughs> right? No, pre-program pre all false beliefs. All right, so that's what made me think of here. Um, Descartes' deceiving demon is supposed to explain why our perceptual beliefs are false right here. Uh, this thesis of moral nihilism has been supported by various reasons, including, I, I got this again from Stanford University, their website, including the pervasiveness of moral disagreement and supposed ability. Uh, with the help of sociobiology and other sciences. Now look, if you say something is morally right and wrong because of evolution, well, it's reduced now to the survival of the species, the furtherance of the human race. That is sociobiological evolution. It has nothing to do with ethics. Uh, since people do take moral nihilism seriously and even argue for it, you'll see that in J.L. Mackey, he was an atheist uh, of Britain, uh, one of my favorite atheists, actually. Uh, moral nihilism cannot be dismissed as readily as Descartes' deceiving demon. Okay, uh, moral skeptics, we are on slide 32 for those who are watching online. Moral skeptics can then argue that the definition of moral nihilism forestalls any refutation. Now let me ask you this. Just because there's moral disagreement in the world, does it follow that there are no moral truths? No. Disagreement doesn't mean anything. We can disagree on everything, but it doesn't mean that there's not a right view out there. So moral disagreement, uh, even if 99% of, of people say we disagree on all these things, what, what, so what? Moral disagreement doesn't mean that there is no truth. Uh, since moral nihilists question all of our beliefs in um, moral wrongness, they leave us with no starting point, we're right here, 
uh, line three, on which to base arguments against them without begging the question. What's begging the question? Assuming what you're trying to prove. Moreover, moral nihilists, uh, their explanations of our moral beliefs predict that we would uh, hold exactly these moral beliefs so the truth of its predictions can hardly refute moral nihilism. You can read this later if this is heavy. Um, if this trick works then, uh, it fits right into a skeptical hypothesis, uh, hypothesis argument. This argument is clearest when applied to an example. If nothing is morally wrong, as Neil has claimed, then it is morally wrong to torture babies just for fun. I mean, it's not morally wrong to torture babies for fun. It's not morally wrong to cannibalize on the homeless. What's wrong with that? So according to the general principle above, one must be able to rule out moral nihilism in order to be justified in believing that torture torching babies just for the mere fun is morally, morally wrong or morally neutral. That would be relativism. Uh, moral skeptics conclude that this moral belief is therefore not justified. More precisely, moral skeptics conclude that this moral belief is not justified in this way. One, I am not justified in believing the denial of moral nihilism. Two, I am justified in believing that P, P is what, we're doing some logic here. We should probably say that for the next class. Um, I am justified in believing that P, it is morally wrong to torture babies just for fun, which entails Q, the denial of moral nihilism. We have already done syllogisms before, so you guys should follow this. Three, if I'm, in, if I'm justified in believing that P is true, and I'm justified in believing that P entails Q, then I'm justified in justified in believing that Q is. Therefore, I'm not justified in believing that it is morally wrong to torture babies just for fun, if moral nihilism is true. Okay, that's slide 33. That's something you can rewrite yourself and put on a 3 by 5 and read it all day and have fun with it. And then once it sinks in, you'll, uh, you'll be good off in logic. This moral belief is not especially problematic in any way. It seems as obvious as many um, as any moral belief, really. So the argument can be generalized to cover any moral belief. Moral skeptics conclude that no moral belief is justified. Uh, two main responses to skeptical hypothetical arguments. First, some anti-skeptics deny, one, that the claim that skeptical hypotheses can be ruled out somehow. Uh, they might argue that moral nihilism is internally inconsistent or meaningless. If so, it can be ruled out by logic. How? Uh, as semantics alone. You ever heard people say that? That's semantics, Nick. No, it's the nature of thought. It's the nature of truth. It's not semantics. Well, you're always flipping the table on me, Nick. Not flipping the table. I'm, I'm applying your principle to your own system. Well, that's just, you know, mantra. No, it's not. It's the nature of thought. It's the nature of logic. Well, that's your logic, not mine. Okay, I got to go. <laughs> <clears throat> not even worth the time. All right. However, moral nihilism does not seem consistent and meaningful according to all plausible theories of moral language. What's plausibility mean? Seemingly true. Plausibility. It's more plausible that God exists in light of ethics than not. Look what you're left with. Okay? So reason says there should be a moral lawgiver. Uh, moral nihilism is also not subject to the kind of argument that Putnam in 1981 deploys against more general skeptical scenarios. Anti-skeptics still argue that moral nihilism is compatible um, with some, with some non-moral facts or observations or their best explanations. If so, it can be ruled out by arguments <coughs> which are not only non-moral premises. However, all such attempts to cross the dreaded is ought. You hear that? The is ought fallacy, the oughtness, the is ought gap are questionable. That is Synod and Armstrong, uh, 2006, chapter 7 through 8. Uh, this is other sources than what you're reading, okay, to make it a little more interesting. So you're not going to find this in the book. A third way to rule out moral nihilism would be based on common moral beliefs that are, quote, incompatible with nihilism. What would be incompatible? Uh, just as it would beg the question to use common beliefs about the external world, the real world that you see, to rule out the deceiving demon hypotheses that we found in Descartes. So we would also beg the question, assuming what it's trying to prove, to argue against moral nihilism on the beliefs of a common moral belief, no matter how obvious those beliefs might seem to us, and no matter how 
well these common beliefs cohere together. A um, lot of stuff there, but this is good philosophy right here, this, the anti-skeptics coming in. Um, one thing I do want to uh, mention is um, next semester, Fall Module 2, we're not doing any of this complex stuff. We're going to be doing world religions. So this is as hard as it's going to get as far as logic and ethics go. But do you understand why most people when they go to they graduate high school and they go to community college and they take a logic and philosophy class and how, how they absolutely hate it? because they don't have a worldview, and they haven't been trained to understand the importance of this stuff. You want to know why most people don't care about this stuff? Because it's hard. It's not easy. What's the name of the Sinat Armstrong book that you're quoting from? I have no idea. Okay, I'll answer it. Yeah, I don't remember. I'll Google it. Yeah, these slides here are so old. Okay. <laughs> it's not even funny. My Geisler book is like red. <laughs> you guys have the white one. <laughs> I think you have a white and blue one, too. All right. Practical moral skepticism resembles epistemological. What's that now? Epistemology. How we know what we know. Science of knowledge. Epistemic. Epistemological moral skepticism in that both kinds of skepticism deny a role to reasons in morality. However, epistemological moral skepticism is about reasons for the belief. Whereas practical, not epistemological, practical moral uh, skepticism is about reasons for the action, reasons to do something. So I can give you a reason to do something, but I can't give you necessarily a reason why you ought to. <laughs> now we're just saying it's the, for the common good. Well, don't say the common good. Just say this is just how it is, or else you're going to bury yourself. Like Confucius say, right? Give man rope, he hangs self. That's essentially what happens. A man who stands upside down on toilet is high on pot. That was also from Confucius. <laughs> no, the former is, not the latter. <laughs> There's like Confucius jokes they made. All right, that the Rastafari people love. I used to be Rastafari, right? Do I look like one? No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. No woman, no cry, though. All right, so, <laughs> consequently, practical moral skepticism. Hey, it's getting late, people. It's almost 10 o'clock in California, and my Swedish is coming out, I know. Sound like I have a speech in Parliament. Say what? I'm just start throwing things at you soon. Okay. <laughs> Can we just live and let live? Just live and let live? You agree, a, 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 let's just agree to disagree, right? I hate that, that statement. Let's agree to disagree. Yeah, you have to be tolerant. Consequently, practical moral skepticism does not imply epistemological moral skepticism. You've got to split the hairs here, especially if you're debating this. Yeah, you're splitting it. <laughs> I'm splitting. I'm out of here. <laughs> Some moral the theorists, uh, which would be a fancy word for moral philosopher, um, do assume that a reason to believe that an act is immoral cannot be adequate unless it provides a reason not to do the act. Uh, I know some of this stuff is a little crazy. But... However, even if the two kinds of reasons are related in this way, if they are, they're still distinct, so practical moral skepticism must not be confused with epistemological moral skepticism. Overall, then, we need to distinguish the following kinds of epistemological moral skepticism. Here's more splitting hairs. Why? Because the longer philosophy goes around, you have philosophers, it takes on these longer names. Epistemological moral skepticism, nihilism will be next, I'm sure, right? Just add another word to it. So, what is dogmatic skepticism about moral knowledge? Nobody ever knows that any substantive moral belief is true. That would be dogmatic skepticism. Dogmatic skepticism about justified moral beliefs. Are you justified in holding your moral view right now? Uh, nobody's ever justified in holding any substantive uh, moral belief. Uh, Parvonian skepticism about moral knowledge withholds assent from both dogmatic skepticism and about moral knowledge and its denial. Um, also, justify moral beliefs withholds uh, from both. Is that the same thing there? Uh, yeah, that looks like a duplicate. That one. We're going to have to call that one. Good night. All right, moving on. We also need to distinguish these epistemological. Let's see here. Yeah, this is, this is good. This will summarize some of it. Uh, skeptic skepticism about moral truth. No substantive moral beliefs are true. Skepticism about moral truth, aptness. No substantive moral belief in the kind of thing that could either be true or false. 
could be either true or false. Skepticism about moral truth value, no substantial uh, moral belief in either true or false, although some moral beliefs are the kind of thing that could be true or false. A little slippery, right? Could be, not sure. And this is when you can argue degrees of plausibility. Degrees of plausibility. Uh, skepticism with moral falsehood. Every substantive moral belief is false. Skepticism about moral reality. No moral properties or facts exist. There's that word, moral properties. Um, practical moral skepticism, there is not always uh, any or enough distinctives, uh, distinctively moral reasons to be moral. Well, okay. Um, you ought to just do what you want, I guess. All right, situationism, moving fast before philosophy. Uh, there's only one ethical norm, and that is love. Da -da 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 -da. Da -da 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 but then the same guy goes, I'm going to do it my way, right? And then where's the love there, right? <laughs> all right, so Fletcher thus argues that while all is relative to the situation, and it's not, all is not relative to the situation. If so, it would just be hardcore relativism. Regardless of what situation one finds one in, you stick to love. Okay, it kind of like goes with love your neighbor. The situation ethics is wrong because the end does not justify the mean. Yeah, what is love? Can you see it? Can you smell it? Can you weigh it? Eh. Okay, so what is it? That's probably just an idea of the philosophers, so call it what you will. Uh, the main claims and problems with antinomianism. No God-given objective moral law. Two, no objective moral values or laws are true. Three, there are thus no timeless morality. So raping a two-year-old for the mere fun of it today, right? It's not necessarily going to be wrong in the future. Because things change, so they would say. There are no law against laws. <coughs> No, if rape is wrong today, it was wrong yesterday, and it's going to be wrong for the next millennia because it goes against the ought, the oughtness in the world, a certain way that things ought to be. Yet some contributions are what? One, it stresses personal and moral responsibility and caution, right? You have to think about these things. That's some contributions. It recognizes emotivism, not true as a system, but true in part. For example, some individual feelings do not have to be grounded in the Ten Commandments to be genuine. Call it conscience. Uh, three, finite ethical, uh, in the final ethical realm, um, I was going to say realism, is realm, while the objectivist, which is us, might at times seem so sure, right, uh, and so certain of objective moral laws deriving from the nature of an infinite being, i.e. God, at the same time, Finite man is somewhat limited in understanding, right? After all, we did not possess an absolute understanding, as Paul admits. Now I understand in part. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll proceed on processism, hedonism, and other skepticism. Uh, remind me, somebody write down slide 39. And right now we're moving straight into philosophy. Um, we're going to cover some philosophy of religion, actually, because I know the book that you guys are reading is quite heavy, right? It's pretty heavy for being an introduction to philosophy. But uh, 